Hello all, welcome back to my channel. Thanks so much for tuning in. We've got the picks for another stellar week of college football action in the 2022 college football season. Before we get to those week eight picks though, let's look back at week seven and review how I did. Week seven had a group of very tough games to call and many of them I made those picks without a very high degree of confidence. However, Utah came through for me with a touchdown and a two-point conversion with less than a minute to go to upset previously undefeated USC. Tennessee came through for me with a field goal at the end of the game to end their 15-game losing streak against Alabama. And then TCU came through for me, coming back from 17 points down and beating Oklahoma State in double overtime. Fabulous games last week. Those three victories helped push me to a 10-3 and record last week in the 13 picks. That is better than I thought I was going to end up when I made those picks a week ago. My overall record this season so far is 84-16, and which is pretty stellar. I was 4-2 and in the top 25 picks last week, which gives me a 13-4 and season record in those matchups. And I was 2-0 and in the top 10 matchups, getting both Tennessee and Michigan right, which pushes me to 3-0 on the season for matchups between top 10 ranked teams. Speaking of, we have another top 10 matchup in the Pac-12 this time for this week's picks, along with four other games between teams that are in the top 25. So without further ado, let's proceed to the picks for week 8 of the 2022 college football season. And we're going to start with the number one team in the nation, the Georgia Bulldogs. They're on a bye this week before their big matchup next week in Jacksonville versus the Florida Gators, but they're off this week, so no pick for the Bulldogs. Number two, the Ohio State Buckeyes. They are hosting Iowa. Iowa's offense is offensive. Ohio State's offense is very good. Marvin Harrison Jr. has filled in very well in wide receiver for the injured Jackson Smith and Jigba. I don't think Ohio State is going to have any trouble with the Hawkeyes at home. Go with Ohio State in that one. Number three, the Tennessee Volunteers coming off a gigantic emotional home win last week against Alabama. A win that saw in the postgame celebration fans from Tennessee tear down the goalposts and throw them into the Tennessee River, which runs right next to the stadium as is apparently now their tradition when they beat Alabama after a long losing streak. They, in a very fortunate instance of scheduling, they are at home this week against the University of Tennessee Martin. If Tennessee was playing a serious opponent this week, if they were playing a tough team from the SEC West, if they were playing LSU, or if they were playing... Ole Miss, or if they were playing even somebody tough from the SEC East, if they were playing Kentucky or something like that, I would be tempted to call this a hangover game and call the upset for Tennessee to lose. But they did a brilliant job scheduling this, so now they're playing UT Martin, who they're going to beat even if the Volunteers are sleepwalking through this game. So go with number three, Tennessee to move to 7-0 on the season and set up a big matchup against Kentucky next week. The number four team in the nation, the Michigan Wolverines, coming off an absolute beatdown of Penn State. I said last week that I thought Michigan would win, but I thought the game would be low scoring. I thought it'd be a lot of defense. I thought it'd be close. And then Michigan goes up and racks up over 400 yards of rushing on a Penn State defense that had been holding its opponents to less than 100 yards rushing, making them look like a bunch of children playing a game against men. That Michigan Wolverine team, they've got a bye week this week <sighs> before they host Michigan State on Halloween weekend. The number five team in the nation, the Clemson Tigers. They are hosting the number 14 team in the nation, the Syracuse Orange. Syracuse coming off a big win at home last week against another ranked ACC opponent, that being North Carolina State. They are now on the road taking on a top 10 ACC opponent in the Clemson Tigers. The thing that stands out to me most when I'm looking at the stats for this game is the fact 
that in terms of pass yards, Syracuse is only throwing the ball around for 153 yards a game. Their quarterback, Schrader, is more of a run-first quarterback. He's a big guy. He's a tough guy. He likes to deliver hits to the opposing defenders when they're trying to tackle him. But the fact that they're only throwing the ball for 153 yards a game means that Syracuse's style of play plays in very well with Clemson's strength on defense, which is their run defense. They're only letting opponents run the ball to the tune of 82 yards a game which doesn't bode well for Syracuse. If they want a shot to win this game, they're going to have to throw the ball down the field. They're going to have to stretch Clemson's defense and not allow them to put more men in the box to stop the running game and start teeing off on Syracuse's quarterback. They're going to have to do that, and I'm not sure if they can do that, especially against the Clemson defense, that not only in terms of rushing yards, but in terms of passing yards, is pretty good and an aggressive defense that can get after the quarterback when they do drop back to pass. I think the fact that this game is at Clemson, I think the fact that Syracuse style of offense fits in very nicely with Clemson style of defense and gives Clemson an advantage and the fact that Clemson after seven games is completing 30% of their third down conversions. That's real good. 50% 50% third down conversion, seven weeks in, seven games in. That's pretty dang good. All three of those factors lead me to believe that Clemson is going to get this win, and they will have yet another win against a ranked team as a feather in their cap. If Clemson can complete this thing, if they can get an undefeated season under their belt with the wins that they've had against a ranked NC State team, against a ranked Wake Forest team on the road, against a ranked Syracuse team, and they can get a conference championship, even if they drop a game and have a one loss and win their conference championship with those three wins if they beat Syracuse, which I think they will, it's going to be real hard to deny Clemson a playoff spot at the end of this season. They are putting together a real good schedule that's going to make them a very attractive pick for the playoffs if they can keep this going. So go with the number five Clemson Tigers to beat the number 14 Syracuse Orange. Number six, the Alabama Crimson Tide coming off that loss last week at Tennessee. They return to the friendly confines of Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and welcome in the number 24 Mississippi State Bulldogs, who themselves are coming off a road loss against Kentucky last week. The stats in this game I don't think matter that much. I think Alabama looks on paper like they're a better team, and I think they are a better team, But I think what matters here is the mindset of Alabama going into this game. If you're the Crimson Tide, I believe that you think you let one get away from you last week. You were down by, I think, as much as 18 points in the first half to Tennessee. And you came back, you took the lead briefly, but then you let Tennessee get the lead back, you let them tie the game, and you let them march down the field and get a field goal on you to end the game in their favor and hand you your first loss of the season. Alabama's got their starting quarterback Bryce Young back who looked pretty good in the game against Tennessee so I'm not really worried about him and what his health status is. Mississippi State lost to Kentucky last week on the road. I don't think Kentucky's anywhere near as good as Alabama especially on defense. I think Alabama is angry. I think they're mad. I think they need to keep pace with other teams in the conference like Georgia and like Tennessee if they want a shot not only at the SEC championship game but also a playoff berth at the end. Alabama's goals are not just going to a conference championship game. It's not just winning a conference championship. It's going to and winning the national championship in the playoffs. With one loss, they're in a bit more dangerous position. They can still easily win the West because I don't think anyone is really challenging them for the West at this point. But then if they go into the SEC title game with one loss and they lose to, say, a Georgia or maybe a Tennessee team and have two losses on the year with Ohio State and Michigan both looking very good in the Big Ten with Okie State, TCU, Kansas all looking pretty good in the Big 12 with USC with UCLA with Oregon all looking good in the Pac-12 
with Clemson looking very good in the ACC, it's going to be very hard to justify taking a two-loss Alabama team into the college football playoff. I think Alabama knows this. I think Nick Saban is going to correct some of the errors that his team has been committing. They are pretty high up there in national rankings in terms of penalties per game. I think Nick Saban will have many of those cleared up. I think they get their act together, and I think they take out the number 24 team in the nation, the Mississippi State Bulldogs. And I'm not even sure if it's all that close. I think Alabama is angry, and the last thing that you want is to face an angry Alabama team that didn't get something that it wanted. R.I.P. to the Mississippi State Bulldogs in this one. The number seven team in the nation, the Ole Miss running Rebels. No one's really talking about Ole Miss. Everyone's talking about Tennessee. Everyone's talking about TCU. Everyone's talking about Alabama. Everyone's talking about Ohio State. Everybody's talking about Michigan. Meanwhile, Ole Miss just keeps winning games. They're 7-0. They're at LSU. LSU proved that they had difficulty a couple of weeks ago with the high-powered, very fast-moving offense run by Tennessee. Ole Miss also has a very high-powered, very fast-moving offense. Their quarterback, Jackson Dart, is not as good as Tennessee's quarterback, Hendon Hooker. But I think the speed with which they move, the quickness with which they call plays, the fast-paced offense will give LSU trouble just like it did a couple of weeks ago against Tennessee. I think Ole Miss is going to win this game. It's not a night game in Baton Rouge, but it is at LSU, so it's going to be a tough environment to play in, but I think Ole Miss has got the goods to get the job done. I'm going to go with Ole Miss to go to 8-0 on the year. The number eight team in the nation, the TCU Horn Frogs, coming off that miraculous win last week at home versus Okie State. They are welcoming another ranked team, another Big 12 ranked team, into the friendly confines of Fort Worth, and that's the number 17 Kansas State Wildcats. When we look at the stats here, nothing really stands out to me other than maybe one thing. That being TCU is much better on third down than is K-State. TCU is much more balanced than K-State is. They rush the ball for 229 a game, pass for 297 a game. K-State is a run-first team with quarterback Adrian Martinez. He would rather run the ball than pass the ball. They're only throwing the ball for 158 yards a game. TCU has a good rush defense, meanwhile, holding opponents to only 135 yards a game. K-State, though, also has a good rush defense, holding their opponents to only 132 rush yards a game. Both teams have a couple of turnovers. Both teams have a bunch of interceptions in their favor. K-State with nine picks, TCU with six. So when you look at the stats, there's an argu argument to be made for both TCU or K-State, depending on which of the stats you think is the most important. One factor that I think is a major factor in this game is Kansas State had a bye week last week meaning they've had an extra week to rest their players up. I watched part of a uh, press conference that their head coach Chris Kleiman did where he said pretty much all the starters are ready to go. They're all rested up. They're all going to play this week at TCU. I could not find anything solid in terms of injury stats or injury reports for TCU or for any team for that matter. They're all very tight-lipped when it comes to the injuries. Um... But they've had an extra week to get healthy. They've had an extra week to game plan for TCU. You can bet that they were watching TCU's comeback against Oklahoma State and what Okie State did to TCU in the first half of that game and were taking notes diligently. TCU, meanwhile, had a big, huge emotional win. They were down by 17 points. They came back, tied the game at the end, went into overtime, went into two overtimes, before they got that win and handed Okie State their first loss of the season. They've had three phenomenal games right in a row, has TCU. The surprising beatdown of Oklahoma a couple of weeks ago, a win on the road at a ranked Kansas team, and this win at home come from behind against an Okie State team. How long can they keep this up? How long can they keep doing this? I think TCU is a very good team. I think they've proven that Max Duggan is a legit quarterback. They've got a number one wide receiver who can damage defenses. They are a good defensive team. They do a lot of things right. 
But I think this game is a letdown game for them. I think there's a bit of a hangover from the high of coming back and beating in exhilarating fashion Okie State last week. Kansas State with a bye week and an extra week to prepare. I think we'll have a game plan that they can utilize. I think they might do some surprising things that TCU is not expecting. I think TCU is going to be tired after having to play extra football last week in a double overtime game. I think emotionally there'll be a little bit of a letdown. I think K-State does just enough to get the job done and hands TCU their first loss on the season. I'm going to go with Kansas State to move to 6-1 and one on the year. Go with number 17, the Kansas State Wildcats. In the only top 10 matchup of the week, we move west into the Pac-12, where the number 9 UCLA Bruins are on the road against the number 10 Oregon Ducks. As seems to be the case this year, the stats don't really tell me anything. How many times have I said that in these picks so far this year? Well, when I look at the stats, nothing really stands out to me because nothing really does. Oregon is a little bit better at running the ball than is UCLA, but it's marginal. UCLA is a little bit better at passing the ball than is Oregon, but it's marginal. Both teams hold opponents to less than 100 rushing yards on the per game on the season. UCLA is a little bit better at pass defense, but again, it's marginal. UCLA is a little bit better at third down conversion, but not too much. They both score some interceptions. Oregon will take care of the ball a little bit more than UCLA does. So what's going to cause me to pick one team over another is where it's at and what the conditions of the game are going to be. This game is at Oregon. Autzen Stadium is one of the most hostile places in the nation, and it is one of, if not the most hostile place in the Pac-12 to have to go win a game that and Oregon, or Utah, excuse me, are, I think, the, the two toughest places to win a game if you're a road team. I think that stadium is going to be electric. I think it's going to be absolutely on fire. And the weather is not going to cooperate with passing-style offenses. It's going to be 52 degrees with a lot of rain on Saturday. UCLA ho uh, head coach Chip Kelly has been having his players this week dip their gloved hands in water to try to practice holding on to the ball in wet conditions. Those wet conditions, I think, are going to tamp down the passing games a bit for both teams. They'll complete passes here and there, don't get me wrong. But I think there's going to be more emphasis on running the ball and ball control than there will be on passing the ball in wet, rainy conditions. I think this plays into Oregon's hands more than UCLA's. I think Oregon quarterback Bo Nix is a bit of a better runner than his counterpart DTR, for UCLA. DTR is a good runner, but I think Bo Nix is a little bit better of a runner, and I think he'll be utilized more extensively in Oregon's run game than DTR will be utilized in UCLA's run game. I think that gives Oregon an edge. I think the home crowd will give Oregon an edge. I'm going to call another upset, and I'm going to say that the number 10 Oregon Ducks are going to hand the UCLA Bruins their first loss on the season much like Utah did to USC last week. And additionally, for the same rationale, I just don't picture UCLA being able to run the table and win the Pac-12 Conference unbeaten and make a pretty clear case that they should be a playoff team. The Pac-12 cannibalizes itself, much like the Big 12 is starting to do this season. I think that continues on this week. Go with number 10, the Oregon Ducks, to get this win. Number 11, the aforementioned Okie State Cowboys. They are returning home to Stillwater to take on the number 20 team in the nation, the Texas Longhorns. Texas has their starting quarterback, Quinn Ewers, back, and they look very good with him as their starter. He's very good in the passing game. Things look like they're just clicking now for Texas more than they were earlier on this year. But they're going into an Oklahoma State team that's mad. If you're Okie State you have to think you let that one go. You have to think that you had that one in your hands and you just let it slip through your fingers as you were tightening the noose on TCU. You were up by 17 points and you let TCU come back and tie the game. You couldn't get them in the first overtime and you lost the game in the second overtime. 
because you couldn't stop Max Duggan and company from getting into the end zone. If you're Okie State and head coach Mike Gundy, you have to be thinking to yourselves, we had it. We had that game won, and we just couldn't finish the deal. We are not going to let that happen to us two weeks in a row, and we're not going to let another team from Texas come in, especially to our house, and hand us a lo- another loss. Okie State needs to keep up with teams like TCU and teams like Kansas for contention for a possible berth in a Big 12 championship game and possibly playoff contention later on this year. I think they're not only mad, but I think they're playing with a little bit of a sense of desperation. And I think as good as Texas is becoming, and when you look at the stats, they're a little bit better than Okie State in a couple of categories. Their run defense is a little bit better. Their run offense is a little bit better. Okie State's pass defense is not as good as Texas's. They're letting up 301 passing yards a game, which bodes well for Texas quarterback Quinn Ewers and that offense. But I think Oklahoma State is going to come into this game focused. Laser-like focused. I don't think they're going to have anything distracting them. I don't think they're going to be looking ahead. I think they're going to be zeroed in on Texas. And I think Oklahoma State is going to get back to their winning ways. And they're going to take down number 20 Texas at home. So go with Oklahoma State in that matchup. Number 12, the USC Trojans coming off their loss on the road last week against Utah. They've got a bye this week before traveling to Arizona next week, which is essentially a second bye. But no pick for USC this week. The number 13 team in the nation, the Wake Forest Demon Deacons, they are traveling to Chestnut Hill, or actually, no, excuse me, they are home versus Boston College this week. Boston College is not a good football team. Wake Forest is a good football team. I'm going to go with quarterback Sam Hartman and that high-powered Wake Forest offense. Go with number 13, the Demon Deacons, in that one. The number 14 team, the Syracuse Orange, as I said a few moments ago, I believe they are going to lose on the road at number 5, Clemson. <clears throat> number 15, the Utah Utes, in another bit of serendipitous scheduling, coming off that huge emotional win at home versus USC last week. They have a bye week this week, so there's no chance of a letdown game, a hangover game for Utah. They are on the road at Washington State next Thursday in a night game, but since they've had extra time to prepare, we'll see what I'm going to call for that game, and I'm already leaning towards Utah a bit. If that game was being played this week, if that game had been played last night, I'd be real tempted to go with Washington State. But Utah's got a bye week this week, so they've got time to get over the emotional hangover and to enjoy that win against USC last week. So no pick for Utah. Number 16, the Penn State Nittany Lions. As I said a moment ago, they were absolutely run through and over and trampled upon by the Michigan running game last week. They return home to the friendly confines of State College, where they welcome in the Minnesota Golden Gophers. Minnesota may be without starting quarterback Tanner Morgan, who suffered a head injury near the end of last week's game. Tanner Morgan isn't that great of a quarterback anyways, though. But anytime you lose your starter and you have to go with a backup, things get more difficult. They do have, though, Minnesota Mo Ibrahim, who is one of the best running backs in the Big Ten. <clears throat> but I think if especially they have a backup quarterback in, they're going to be one-dimensional, and Penn State is going to do everything it can to not let the same thing happen this week that happened last week. I'm going to go with Penn State to clean up their act in the running game with their run defense and to go to 6-1 on the season. Go with the Nittany Lions over the Golden Gophers in that matchup. The number 17 Kansas State Wildcats, I've already predicted, I believe will go on the road and beat the number 8 team in the nation, the TCU Horned Frogs. Number 18, the Illinois Illini at 6-1, coming off a win against the aforementioned Minnesota Golden Gophers. They've got a bye this week. As does the number 19 team in the nation, the Kentucky Wildcats, coming off that home win against Mississippi State last week. They've got a week to rest up and to game plan for a gigantic matchup on the road at Tennessee next Saturday. Number 20, the Texas Longhorns. I've already said I think they are going to lose on the road to Oklahoma State. Number 21, the Cincinnati Bearcats at 5-1. They're on the road at SMU. I didn't do too much looking into this game, 
From what I understand, SMU can put up a lot of points, but so can Cincinnati. SMU's run offense doesn't seem like it's that good, though. I think Cincinnati's got a good defense. I don't make this call with a high degree of confidence, though, because away games are always tricky. SMU, I think, is 3-3, three and three, but they're dangerous as, an, as a home underdog in this one. I'm going to go with Cincinnati, but I don't think this is going to be a beatdown. I think this is going to be a close game, but I'm going to roll with Luke Fickle and company. I think Cincinnati gets the job done. The number 22 team in the nation, the North Carolina Tar Heels at 6-1. and one. They have a bye week this week. As does the number 23 team in the nation, the North Carolina State Wolfpack. Coming off that loss against Syracuse last week, they've got another week to rest and to get their new starting quarterback into the game and to study for their game next Thursday against Virginia Tech. So no pick for North Carolina State this week. Number 24, the Mississippi State Bulldogs. I've already said I believe that they are going to lose to the number 6 team in the nation, the Alabama Crimson Tide. And then finally, rounding out the top 25, and in the top 25, for the first time in 24 years, the Tulane Green Wave at 6-1. and one. They welcome in the Memphis Tigers. I don't know anything about Tulane other than that they're 6-1 and one and they're the 25th ranked team in the nation. I don't really know much about Memphis other than I've seen them play in a couple of games. One, they looked really good. One, not so good. But just like I love seeing Syracuse in the top 25, Kansas in the top 25, even though they aren't currently, Cincinnati back in the top 25, James Madison was in the top 25 last week until they lost. Let's go with the mean green. I'm going to roll with number 25, Tulane, despite knowing nothing about them. Let's go mean green. Get yourself to 7-1. And, and that's going to do it for the week 8 picks. Thanks so much for watching. Let me know in the comments down below what games are you looking forward to watching this weekend and why. Where do you think I've gone right in my picks this week and why do you think that? And where do you think I've gone wrong in my picks this week and why do you think that? Thanks so much for tuning in, everyone. I'm looking forward to the games this week. I hope you are too. And I'm also looking forward to seeing you again in the next video. Thank you.